Praise God. Praise His holy name. And I feel liberty here tonight. Oh, hallelujah. Church, let's just lift our voices just one more time. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost here tonight. You know, God can change folks. God can make a move on folks that you and I can't do. He can touch the heart tonight. Amen. Praise God. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I, I want you to sing a little bit more of that song. I, I, church, I want to give God a chance tonight. Amen. I don't want to just get in a hurry. We've got plenty of time. I want to give God a chance. And let's, let, let's worship Him. And let's give God an opportunity to deny.
praise his name. Oh, my, 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 my. It's the presence of the Lord here tonight, church. I feel the liberty. I feel the praise. I feel the, the worship that God has in store for this church and his people. You continue to do as you do and give him reverence and worship. He said he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. He is that. He's true to his word, isn't he? Yes, he is. And I'm so thankful, so thankful. I want to say again tonight, thank you, praise team, for your sacrifice, for your prayers, for your fasting, and what you do each and every day for these services that we have here today, that God moves and moves in a mighty way. Brother Daly, I'm trusting in the Lord. Amen. Good brother, I'm trusting in the Lord for your wife. God will take care of those situations. Praise God. Let's give the Lord a good hand clap tonight. I, I tell you, I, I feel the presence of the Lord here. God is so good, so good. Praise God. Brother Brafa, come on. I'd like to say that Brother Brafa is no stranger to this church and this church family. And I'd like to say that I appreciate him and his wife so very much. Behind the scenes, in a lot of ways, they were there. And I appreciate you, good man, you and that lady back there. I, I tell you, we love, we love you all so very much. So thank you, so thankful that you're home. <laughs> Praise the Lord. You can be seated. Uh, I was told one time, you think too much. A preacher came, uh, uh, and he called me out, and he said, You're, you are going to get so good at not thinking. And I was like, well, I don't want to be like other people, you know. I, I want you to keep on doing what you're doing. I just want you to give me the ability to do something with it. And, and I want to show you how it works. You know, when, they, when, the, when the singers sing about God's mercy, you know, scripture should automatically come to our mind and say, and no matter what went wrong during the day today and everything went wrong, God's mercies are made new every morning. They're there all the time. They're, they're going to follow you wherever you go. You know, uh, when uh, they were talking, singing about making this place an altar, you know, I, I, my mind goes in, to the to the scripture again. It, I'm all, it's like whenever the word is sung, we are blessed to have musicians that sing and the spirit that is there with them because scripture, that's what should happen. Scripture comes to mind and says that, lets us know that wherever we go, you know, the, the tabernacle was in the wilderness, but the tabernacle's mobile now and it's in us and it goes wherever we go. You know, we can pray tonight, God, you know, we ask that you would inhabit the praises of the people, but how many have the Holy Ghost here? Would you raise your hand? You know, the, and every one of us brought the Spirit of God with us. Every one of us. So, so it, you know, where he says, where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. When they were singing on Sunday night and they said, I can only imagine, I can only imagine. And my, I'm, in my mind, I'm thinking, you don't have to imagine what's going to happen, whether you're going to bow down or whether you're going to be up worshiping. Because the 24 elders were down on their faces worshiping God. Daniel, when he saw the Lord, what happened to him? His knees started knocking and he fell down. John the Beloved, when, when he saw in the, in the revelation of Jesus Christ, he saw him. This was the man that walked with him, was his closest confidant. When he saw him, he said he fell to his face. You know, we don't, you know, my, our minds, you know, that's, I think David said, you know, that he wanted the mind of Christ. God, give me your mind. Give me your heart. So if I'm all over the place tonight, you're going to know why it is. Because, uh, you know, the, the word of God comes, and I wish, I wish the Yankee in me would come out and I could speak 100 miles an hour like we do up there. And I want to say this. When we first got down here and we came to the south, uh, back in 1985, and there was a grocery store where Stage is. I don't remember the name of it, but we would go in there, and I think Dana Burns was working the cash register, and she was taking forever to give us the change back. And I told my wife, I said, what is the matter with these people down here? 
they're, they're, they seem so slow at what they're doing. But, you know, after, after a while, I realized they're just enjoying their life. I didn't enjoy my life. You know, I was going 90 to nothing. You know, so, again, I'm going to be all over the place today. But I can't even name the message. I would have to say you name it because I know the way God works. It, it, you know, you can name it all you want to, and that's sometimes that's not all. I, I never got anything about what that name, what they named it, brother. Brother Pennington, it's, you know, God speaks to us all differently. And he does that because we're the body. Pastor came into the office one day and we started talking and he, and, you know, we were talking about the body of Christ and how everybody is different and how it took years for me to get the revelation that in ministry, that everything that happens doesn't have to happen inside the church, you know? And the Lord showed me one day, he just started I just started talking to him, and he, he said, well, just consider Paul and Peter, the difference in the two of them. Peter was, he and James stayed back and took care of the church in Jerusalem. But when Paul got it, he was gone. He was gone. They're, they're in a world of snowflakes. I don't want to say that they're, that I don't want to compare myself or you to a snowflake, but there is no Nobody else that has your ministry. No one in the body. If there's anything that we've learned over the last few years, it is we've learned a lot about the body and the DNA and spike proteins, which I'll claim is the Holy Ghost, you know, uh, you know because that's what spiked my life. You know, it, it's what changed my DNA. I joke with my wife one time, I, you know, again, you think about things and I think, I wonder what would have happened if they took my DNA before I got the Holy Ghost and after they got it, after I got it. Because science knows today that they can change. They're, they're going in and changing what God made. They are going in uh, and modifying the very creation that makes people unique, that God created in them. Everything, every trait, that is that you are made of, man is trying to interfere with. That's a dangerous place to be, Brother Pennington. You, you don't mess with God's creation, just like you don't mess with his people, because the word of God is clear that it's better that you have a millstone tied about your neck and cast into the sea than to offend one of these little ones. You know, and, and that's what the word of God is for, for us. But I was talking at the men's meeting the other day, and I, I kind of, told my wife, I said, I'm not sure I want to go. You know, I'm, I'm just different from other people. You know, I'm, I'm very different. And uh, she said, no, you need to go. You, you need to go. And I said, well, I'll go. And I ended up talking with Brother Louise, Louise, and I talked with Brother Tannery, and I talked with Brother um, Midkiff. And Brother Midkiff had, a, had such a good presentation he talked about how the church, we can't lose our identity, that we're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, you know, a peculiar people that we should show forth the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And when he finished his presentation, I went up and started talking to him and Brother Tannery, and I said, you know, there's a challenge. The challenge for the 21st century church is this. We have to keep our uniqueness, but yet we have to get out there in the world and reflect Jesus Christ. And I believe I have scripture that'll back up everything I say tonight, but I'm going to start with a commercial, I guess. That's with what Royal Caribbean had said. Some, they, they have an advertisement that says, get out there that you have to get out there and, and do things, take an excursion, get out there, not into the world. You know, the word of God is clear. Fellowship with the world is enmity with Jesus Christ. But, but yet the challenge is, the, there's another scripture that Paul said, I became all things to all men that I might, some, that I could save some. You know, so there, there is a balance in doing this and there's a challenge, and if I'm saying anything wrong, pastor will clarify, he'll fix it for me. 
you know, when he comes back. I know he can do that. He does it in a very subtle way, <laughs> you know, and uh, he's done it to, uh, to me in the last two months that we've been here. I thank God for, for the, the word that has been coming forth from the men of God that are, are allowed to minister here. Uh, you're blessed. But if you would stand for a minute, I want to read, I want to read something. And it's, it's, a, it's a long reading, but it's the word of God. And if nothing else, anything I say might not have mattered, but this matters. Luke chapter 7 and verse 33 through 50 says, For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and ye say that he hath a devil. And the Son of Man come, and he's eating and drinking. And behold, and ye say, behold, he is a gluttonous man and a wine babbler and a friend of publicans and sinners. But wisdom is justified in all her children, in the children. You have, we have to do this. You can be seated. We have to do this with wisdom. Uh, I'm going to keep reading. I didn't want you to have to stand because there's, there are several other verses. But I had a conversation with somebody the other day, and I said, well, when do you think you're ready to get out there and start doing this? And I said, well, when were the disciples ready? You know, Jesus, you know, started his ministry at 30 years old. And within three years, he was saying, now go. You know, he sent him out by twos. He sent out the 12. He sent out the 70. And they came back, you know, and he told them, when you go out there, you look, if they receive you, hey, stay there and keep on doing it. Keep on doing it. And if they reject you, then just move on to another town. You know, and, and in, in this world that we live, I, I think about and I'm going to do this from memory. I don't know if it's a case now, but Dr. Johnson, you know, you're, we join things like the Lions Club so that we can get out there with the world and rub shoulders, not with the things that they do, but that they can see that we're not that different after all. We are peculiar, but we're different. And we join, we join I've joined several clubs to say this, and like I said, if this is wrong, pastor will, will clarify it. But the only way that we can touch the world is for the body, and I'll say the church building as being the torso, but yet we're the feet, you know, and the ar we're the arms and the legs and the, and, the, and the feet and the hands. We've got to get out there because, and it's a challenge to do it. It's, it because if, if, if you're not ready, don't do it. But I, I personally, and I guess this is <laughs> Brafa, the book of Brafa, I don't know. But I believe that my Holy Ghost is not that fragile. That Jesus, Jesus gives the example, and I better go ahead and read it, because I don't want you to think, well, he's really getting out there. But this is what Jesus did. You know, he was, he, he actually gathered 12 men that were just fishermen. I mean, one was a doctor, you know, uh, one was an IRS agent. You know, nobody likes them. And you know he had to be bad. Well, we have 87,000 of them coming around shortly. And, and don't be surprised if they don't want to pull them from the church to create even more division. You know, but, but the, the people that he took from the world to do his work, they weren't of the best reputation. One of them betrayed him for 30, 30 pieces of silver. But I'm going to keep reading in verse 36, and it says, And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment and stood at his feet behind him weeping. I think too much, but every time I see the woman with the alabaster box in a play, there, she's always in front of him. But it says that she stood behind him, and she was washing his feet. I know it doesn't matter to you, but some, I don't know why. I think of things like this. You know, just like I think of people say there's not going to be any animals in heaven. But how are we going to come back on horses if there's no animals in heaven? You know? You think too much. 
Now when the Pharisees, which had bidden him, saw it spake within themselves, saying, this man, if he were a prophet, <laughs> oh, he was more than a prophet, but if he were a prophet, he would have known who and what manner of woman this is that touched him, for she's a sinner. And Jesus answering said unto him, and he never spoke it out, but Jesus knew his thoughts. He knows the very thoughts and the intents of our heart. Said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say, say to thee. And he said, if master, say on. This shows the gentleman that the Lord is. He, you know, he just asked him a question. He didn't say, I know what you're thinking. He just said, I'm, I need to ask you something. So, so nobody else knew what, what was going on at this point. There was a certain creditor that had two debtors. And one owed 500 pence and the other 50 and when they had paid, had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them loved him the most? And Simon answered and said unto him, Well, I suppose that he which he forgave the most. And he said, and this was a lesson for Simon, because he had that 500. And the woman probably only had the 50. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, See thou this woman, I entered into thy house, and thou gavest me no water for my feet, and she has washed my feet with her tears, and wiped them with her hair, the hairs of her head. I slowed down because my mind went to the song that uh, C.C. Winan sings, and I love that song, because it tells the story, this story, and it tells it so compassionately. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman, since the time I came, hath not ceased to kiss my feet. And my head with oil, thou hast not anointed, but this woman hath anointed my feet with oil. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved, she loved much, but to whom little is given, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, thy sins are forgiven. My mind goes to James, the book of James, when they said, if there's any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church and anoint him with oil. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick. You can get healed. I don't know what our brothers came up here for, but you can get healed. But he also said that, and your sins will be forgiven. They probably didn't even come up for sin. They probably came up for healing or, or another need. But you see how God is. Yes. You know, it's, it's a double blessing. And they that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves, who is this that forgives sin also? And he said unto the woman, thy faith has saved thee. Go in peace. We don't know what happens when we step out. Pastor, before he left, and we heard about Kaylee, uh, uh, Kylie, Kaylee, I'm sorry, but his daughter. I said, you know, Brother Christian, I said, I just have to tell you this. I just have one of those minds that I, I just think of things, you know. And, and I started thinking about some of the, the philosophers and, and some of the geniuses of the world uh, and I thought about Newton, and he said, he said this, and I think this is Brother Christian's case, that with every force, there was an equally opposing force, that, which is to say this, Brother Christian, you're a force, you know, for good, and the adversary is coming against you with evil. That's, that's exactly what, you know, it, uh, Newton didn't, say it in comparison to scripture, but he didn't know how close he was. You know, it's, it's that when we press on, and that's why with the music and everything that's happening right now, what, you know, and that happens every service just about, 
because that say, when you just say, like, they'll just sing this one more time, that is the force that breaks the gap. That is, what, that is just what shuts the devil down. You know that, and, and I'm telling you this, and I probably le uh, worship least than anybody in the church, you know, but inside I'm all over the place. I, I was like, oh, I gotta change my clothes. I told my wife, man, I was all over the place. She's <laughs> you know, this passage of, of scripture is the biggest challenge, I said that before, for the church today, because we have to get out there but Jesus did it by example. He ate with the sinners. He intermingled with them. You know, he, he got to the point where, and he must have looked like them in a way and dressed like them in a way. And I'm not trying to reduce a standard in any way, shape, or form. I mean, you can, I think you can tell that about my own life. You know, I believe that if I'm coming to see the king, or I'm coming with the possibility of meeting the king in here, I'm going to dress as good as I would if I was going to go to be judged at, by seeing Judge Eves, you know. I think that there's a uniform for everything, Brother uh, Whitehurst. You know, the Army proved that to me. When I was running PT, I put on clothes that I was running. When I was working, I put on fatigues. When I was going to a semi-formal function, I wore greens. When it was formal, you wore blues, you know. But when we come before the king, you know, even our best genes will do. You know, but it's, it's just that there is a standard. I'm trying to make sure you understand. I'm not trying to, to lower a standard at all. But it, it's getting out there and get because being a part of the body, I mentioned it before, we have the singers and the musicians and that is, that is the vocal part of the body of Christ and that is the musical part and some people, well, Brother Hill's shaking his head, but I, I can't believe that Brother Hill's son can play just about every instrument that's out there. You know, he's more than just, he's got more than one talent, you know. But, but that's, that's the way we all are. But the challenge for today for us is to find out what our talent is within the church. And I want to say it this, this way, what your ministry is in the church. And I can look around and say, I can look around and I can say, well, I see your congregation. And, I, you know, I, I, I know that Brother Manasco, the work that he does, he has clients all over the place. But every one of those are members of his congregation that he has a, a sphere of influence over. I can look at Brother and Sister Hilton out there, and I know that those, those storage buildings that are out there, that's like a congregation of 20. And the, and the people that rent from them, they're, those are all ministry opportunities, you know, and, and we have to really step back and realize that, that at the, at the PCA, you might not be over the, that P, is it called PCA? Is that what it is out there? But you, you might not be over it, but that you have a sphere of influence over all those people, a ministry opportunity. And God, that's what God has shown me when I, I go back to Peter and, and Paul, because Paul got out there. You know, Paul did it with everything in it, wherever he went, he did it. And I, I wanna say, I wanna say something else because, and we're all, you know, we have about seven minutes left. I may be all over the place still, but in Acts the sixth chapter, if you remember there were, the, the 12 disciples said something, and, and this is another one of those work things that I want, I want you to see because what the 12 disciples said was, it's not me. There was, there was a problem between the Grecian and the Hebrews. And, and they said, it's not me that we wait tables. You know, we want to give ourselves full time to the ministry. And they said, choose out seven men among you that are full of the Holy Ghost. And they did. They, who did they, they chose Stephen. I'll just go with the most popular. Stephen, Philip, uh, Nicanor. There were, there were several of, of the men that, that they picked out. And those guys were to wait tables. That was their, they were to do the business that was happening in the church. But the next thing that you find is, in the very next two or three chapters, I don't find them waiting tables, Brother Pennington. You know what I see? What I see them, they must have waited tables by day. 
and Stephen was out ministering to the Pharisees and the Sadducees at nighttime or, you know, later in the day sometime because the next thing happens to him is he gives the best sermon you've ever heard in a chapter and a half, and the next thing you know, he's stoned. He is stoned. Then, then the next chapter picks up, and what happens? We see Philip, and he's ministering to the Samaritans, and the Holy Ghost gets poured out. Uh, this is the guy that was waiting tables, okay, that he was supposed to be waiting tables. So uh, I'm saying this because it doesn't matter what you're doing. If we're doing it unto the Lord, oh God, we, we at least plant. Paul said, I plant Apollos waters and God will give the increase. The next thing we see is, is Philip again. Man, this guy's on the, on the move. He's, he's headed out of town from Jerusalem. And he sees this eunuch prince, and he, he sees him reading the word of God. And he says, hey, do you understand what you're reading? And he says, he says what many people say to us. You know, how can I unless somebody explains it to me? And he kind of prepares the way for us when knowing when somebody's ready to be baptized. He, he told him, he said, who is this they're talking about? And uh, I think it's where he said, I, he was wounded for our transgression, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we were healed. It just happened. It just happened back in Jerusalem. You know, you came to celebrate. And, and what, he, what he says is he got it. He got the revelation of, of Jesus Christ. And he said, I th he said, I think I'm ready to be baptized. And what did Philip say? You know when you're ready to be baptized because if you believe with all your heart, then it's time for you to be baptized. Jeremiah, Jeremiah said in, in uh, Jeremiah 29 and 11, he said that God has a plan for your life. God, well, God said this to Jeremiah. I have a plan for your life. A plan of good and not of evil to give you an expected end. What do you, you know, what do you, what do you think that meant? To give you an expected end? What do you think? Well, I've, I've read the back of the book and I know what to expect. I, I know that we've won. I know that no matter what happens with the chaos that's going on right now in the world, that I know what my end will be. If I can just keep, hold, hold fast my strength. It doesn't matter what's going on, but if, if you can hold on to it and do the work of God, that God gave you to do. And they say that most of the kids that go to college today are say, are they, they want to know the purpose of their life. They want to know what they were born for. They change fields two or three times before they graduate. I know that because I financed it, you know. But, they, you know, they change, they change their minds several times. But eventually, God shows them you know, what their, what their calling or what that ministry was. And uh, if you haven't already asked God, and look, look, I'm 64 years old and I'm just getting this. You know, I, I'd like to say I found this out a long time ago, Brother Pennington, but I didn't. You know, this is a lifetime journey for all of us. Every one of us. I'm thinking of something else again. Brother uh, Mahoney that was just here, and I know that you probably remember this because I'll tell you the devil, the devil has tormented me with this. Uh, when we came back here before, and we were here for three years, and I wanna tell you this, we don't just come and go because we're unstable. We come and go because we see that we saw here, there's so much talent here. We're not really needed. And we, and we went around and, we, and uh, we visited somewhere and we saw they need some help here. So we said, it's, it's time for us to go. You know, and we, went, and we went and did that because we just want to do the will of God. But Brother Mahoney said, he talked about a brother craft and he did, 
that I don't know if you all heard this, but I heard it loud and clear because he was talking directly to me. He said, Brother Kraft, when he came up and started preaching when he was a younger man, he got up, he started speaking, and that was it. He didn't know where, he was like me. You, I, I, that happened to me one time here. And I asked God, why did that happen? I just looked at Brother John because I sat at the feet of Gamaliel. Brother John raised me in this church for 18 years, and I looked at him, and he was like, you're on your own, brother. <laughs> you know, <laughs> And I was on my own. But I'm thinking, I said, God, what is this, what is this about? Uh, and it's, it's never happened. But when he said that about Brother Kraft, I can't tell you how the devil was tormenting me. What were those? What do you think those people thought of you? What do you, what do you suppose? You know, because I just, I just handed the mic to Brother Christian. He took off, got everybody shouting. People probably got the Holy Ghost, <laughs> you know. But uh, the, the devil will tell you, oh, you can't, you know, your ministry isn't that way. And that's why I'm, I know I'm, it's clear to me. I have a specific ministry. It's, it's sometimes one-on-one. -on -one. It's prophecy. It is, it is teaching. It is, it is the practical Christianity that just says we, that in him, if we will just in him live and move and have our being, that's ministry. That is ministry. And, and you don't know the influence that that will have. And Brother Christian told me that. And I'm like, what are you talking about? You know, I, don't, that, I, want, I want more than that. I go to bed every night saying, God, I want more. I just want more of you, not more money, not more <laughs> things. I just want more of you. I want you to just keep putting those thoughts in my brain because one day, and I, and I, I can tell you this, you know, I have probably 500 sermons in here, but I still say, God, when are you going to use me? When are you going to, when are you going to do this? And I, I'm not the only one, you know. Uh, would you give me a, a nod or, or something and say, you know, God, you want, we all want to be used. We all want to do something significant for God before our time is up on this earth. And I think what drives us to that is the word of God. Is, is, it, is, it is the fact that he said he gives you a talent. Nobody else has that talent. He, he gave, there was a situation in the word of God, and I'll close with this. He, he gave one man one talent. He gave another man two talents, and he gave Brother Hill's son five, you know. And, but when he comes back, when the Lord comes back, he's going to ask Brother Hill's son, what did you do with those talents? Well, and Brother Hill's son, not that he's going to justify himself, but while I can tell you this, while he played that music, I don't know how many people have received the Holy Ghost, you know? And I, I look at those things and I, and I compare those things and say, God, you know, he, he gave the one that had two, he, he came back and he said, here's two more. But the one that had one, he said, I, he, he said, he said I, I just took it and I buried it. He, he took it, put his light under a bushel basket. He did it because he thought the Lord was such a hard taskmaster and so judgmental that, that what he did was he hid it. And the Lord said to him, if you would have just, he said, if you would have just took that talent, we know he was talking about money, but if you would have just took that talent and put it in the bank and gained a little bit of interest, I wouldn't be saying, depart from me, you evil and wicked servant. So it doesn't have to be something great. It just has to be something, and it has to be something for the Lord. You know, we all want a, a number count. Uh, you know, I would love to say how many people that I've won to the Lord, and I can count them on a couple of hands, the people that have gotten the Holy Ghost. But, you know, I told Brother, I think I told Brother Tanry or, or Brother Midkiff the other, the biggest thrill I got was in 1989 when the church was just being built. Um, and there was, there was nothing up here. There was a forklift that sat here and it didn't run one day. 
and uh, it was down and they needed the metal studs. And I remember my sons and I carrying most of those metal studs up the steps while the church was being built. And Brother John, when I was in Korea by myself, he sent me a videotape saying, hey, Brother Frankie, here's up. You know, he, he's standing out there and he's showing pictures of Sister Teasley and everybody. And, and he's saying, uh, he said, look at what's going on here now. We're, you know, we're almost ready to be in the, in the church. We just wanted to show you, you know, what was going, what was going on. But the, I think the biggest thrill was to be able to be part of something like this. You know, to be, to be part of not, not just the building, but of the body of Christ. You know, to be able to, to do something, anything for the Lord anything. And I don't know, I, I know it's all over the place, but I hope that maybe something that was said tonight in this teaching, preaching, whatever you want to call it, I hope that you've been exhorted, you know, exhorted to know that God has a plan for your life. And I didn't say this, but in Habakkuk, Chapter 1 and verse 5. During the times when everything was going wrong in Habakkuk's life, and he was complaining to the Lord, Lord, you didn't, you're not hearing anything I'm saying. God's response to him was this. I know it, but I don't want to lose anything in it. Habakkuk 1 and verse 5 says this, Behold ye among the heathen and regard and wonder marvelously. For I will work a work in your days which ye will not believe though it be told you. You know, he, he said, you may think, God said, you may think I'm not hearing what you're saying. And I see that you're among these heathens and I see this world that you're in. And if you, in case you haven't read the book of Habakkuk, they're going back and forth. And Habakkuk is complaining to God and God's saying how he's going to use them. But Habakkuk had to recognize the voice of God. That, that was my problem. You have to recognize the voice of God and then do what he says to do. And know this, that the plan that he has for you in your life is so great that if somebody told you you wouldn't even believe it. The, the people that do know their God in these last days shall be strong and do exploits. That's it. I hope you were blessed. I, I've never been much for, you know, I've never been much for a closing, but... It just does, it doesn't end. His mercy is going to be made new tomorrow morning. Lord bless you. Oh my, that was, that was great, Brother Bratha. I will work a work in your days. Put, can you put that scripture back up there, good man, if you don't mind? Man, I'm telling you, I like that. He said this, and I'll use a portion of it. The wonder is marvelous, for I will work a work in your days which ye will not believe, though it be told, even if I told you, I'm still going to work that work. My goodness, man, that's great. That's good stuff. Let's come to the front just for a few minutes, just for a few seconds. Amen. I tell you, I, I was thinking as Brother Broffer was preaching, he was talking about our good pastor things that happen in life and that's the reason why I say sometimes brother Bratha that I worry about when I get comfortable and things are all all right and I'm not to say we live for oppression we live for things to happen to us by no means God does not he doesn't want that he wants you to live a good life but I wonder sometimes because of what Paul said what Paul said. He said, when I would do good, evil is present. 
It's on every hand. It's everywhere. When I, when I would do good. And you know what? In the days and the lives that we live, as this man said here tonight, to live strong. He said, I will work a work in your days which you will not believe. You're living in that time right now. There is the greatest opportunity in life that ever has. When people walk in those doors and feel the touch of God and moves on their lives. And I don't know what it is, Brother Micah, how it gets a hold of your heart and changes you. It changes you. And you have a different perspective in the way because I will work a work in your life. I will work a work in your life. Oh, my goodness. Lay your hand on somebody and let's pray for each other tonight. Thank you, Jesus, for this word tonight. Thank you, God, for this work tonight. I ask you, God, to bless my brother and my sister, God. Lord, give him strength tomorrow until the next appointed time, God. And help them, God, and create in them, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Can you do that tonight, church? You know, it's sometimes in our walk with life. I don't know how I would make it without God. I, I don't. I really don't. But I'm so thankful for this church that helps me each and every day. Amen. You say, well, Brother Pennington, I, I'm telling you, you have no idea. Your worship, what I see on your faces, how I perceive your spirit. And who you are and living for God, it's encouraging to me. It strengthens me because we do it for each other. Amen. I don't know if you know this or not, but I need you, Brother Brof. I need you, Brother Boy. I need you, Brother Nash. I need all of you. Amen. For me. Praise God. All of you in the balcony. I need you. <laughs> oh, praise God. Thank you, Brother Brophick. Go by and shake this man's hand. He did a great job tonight. Yes, amen. Praise God. You're dismissed in the fear of the Lord tonight.